Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on digital accessibility laws and requirements. My name is Kim Testa. I am an executive vice president here at the Bureau of Internet Accessibility. Joining us today on our call is Mark Shapiro, who is the founder and president of the Bureau of Internet Accessibility. During the, our years of experience, we have worked with thousands of organizations to help them with their digital uh, accessibility, and we have experience across all industries, and we bring that depth of knowledge to the table in all of our auditing processes. Our digital products and services include complete audits using both human and artificial intelligence against the WCAG 2.1 level A and double A. We offer training, uh, which are self-paced and live training for a team or even just one individual. We offer support and remediation. We're there with you throughout the entire process. We also offer web, mobile, PDF, application testing, and even kiosk testing. We also offer automated testing platform, which is our automated proprietary scanning tool, and legal and compliance assistance. We work directly with your legal and compliance team to ensure that you have the proper documentation to prove your level of accessibility. Also joining us on the call today is Christian Antkoviak who is the, a shareholder in the Labor and Employment Group of Buchanan Ingersoll. He's handled many cases involving claims relating to the ADA, especially those involving public accommodation, both physical location and website accessibility. Today's agenda is going to include what is digital accessibility, legal landscape, digital accessibility laws, testing standards, demand letters, litigation and settlements, best practices, and questions and answers. If we're not available to get through all the questions, please email us at contact at boia.org and we will follow up with the answers. And now Mark Shapiro will talk about digital accessibility. Thanks, Kim. Digital accessibility is about removing barriers so that users who have visual, auditory, motor, or cognitive disabilities can utilize your digital assets, such as your website, your mobile application, and your electronic documents. It allows people to use, perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with your digital assets. If websites are designed correctly, people who use assistive technologies such as screen readers, special keyboards, or visual mice will have the same access as someone who doesn't require assistive technology. The audience who may require assistive technology includes people with epilepsy, people with cognitive impairments, people with low vision, or people that are blind or even colorblind, people with age-related impairments, people with mobility issues, and people with hearing impairments. Most people think of the ADA in terms of ramp access to a building or a bathroom stall that can accommodate a wheelchair, but the law is actually much broader. The law is intended to include all public and private places that are open to the general public, which also includes your website, your mobile application, and all your digital assets, including PDFs. The Department of Justice considers website accessibility to be a legal obligation. They have actively pursued organizations in all industries, including education, retail, and financial. The DOJ lawsuits have cost companies millions of dollars to defend and have all ended in a settlement that requires companies to make sure that their websites are accessible. Lawyers are extremely active on this too, and they don't discriminate on industry or size. Large companies such as Pandora and Nike have been sued, but other small organizations like Dinosaur Barbecue and Dumbo Moving and Storage have also been sued. Last year, there were almost a thousand cases filed in federal court 
that's a two and a half fold increase from the prior year. The majority of these were actually not filed in federal court. They were in the form of a demand letter and that number looks like it could be in excess of 30,000 demand letters sent out. The pace of these demand letters and cases are expected to continue to accelerate for the foreseeable future. Thanks, Mark. Uh, again, my name is Christian Ankoviak. I'm from the law firm of Buchanan, Ingersoll & Rooney. Um, I handle a number of ADA um, cases, including those involving website accessibility. And one of the questions that my clients, um, when first faced with these issues, often ask me is, you know, geez, I didn't realize that um, my website needed to be accessible. I'm not familiar with the law in this area like I might otherwise be familiar with um, ADA issues. Tell me a little bit about the federal law and what I need to understand. And so, you know, we typically start with the federal law, but we're also focused on state and industry specific as uh, the case may be. For today's purpose, I'm going to talk to you first about um, federal law and to try to give you an understanding of the context within which these ADA issues arise. Um, for those of you who don't know, the ADA requires that places of public accommodation need to be accessible. And I think most of us understand that in terms of what needs to be um, accessible in a brick and mortar location, um, but haven't realized that those um, requirements may also apply to cyberspace. Um, first, you know, we think about public accommodations, what are they? Um, they're generally businesses open to the public and they fall in one of 12 categories, such as retail stores, restaurants, hotels, theaters, doctor's offices, museums, um, even private schools and daycare centers. You know, most businesses operating uh, some form of physical facility open to the public um, are gonna fall within uh, that definition. So beginning back in 2006, and I'm gonna try to put this in a little bit of context for everybody, uh, private litigants and the Department of Justice began filing legal actions based on inaccessible websites. And over time, this has grown to include mobile applications uh, as well. So disabled persons obviously can sue under the ADA alleging they were denied full and equal access to goods and services. That's extended to websites because websites are an obvious extension of uh, brick and mortar facilities. The problem is that under the ADA, the law itself only talks in general terms about principles, equal access, and equal opportunity. Um, on the physical side, there have been uh, technical requirements promulgated for things like uh, the number of parking spaces and you know width of aisles in stores. Uh, for websites, we don't have those technical requirements yet. Um, so it creates a gray area in which uh, most of this litigation uh, has come about. Because of that, the standard for what needs to be accessible under the ADA when it comes to websites is relatively unsettled. So there's no current laws or regulations, again, on that technical side. Um, a lot of what folks have sort of looked to are general industry standards. And I think Mark's gonna talk a little bit later in the program about those industry standards. Um, they were promulgated by W3C, it's an international consortium. Um, that consortium's um, standard known as WCAG 2.0 is one that's often cited by counsel and the Department of Justice alike in litigating these cases. In fact, DOJ has been insisting that websites and mobile applications be brought into compliance with WCAG 2.0. And to be fair, there are different degrees of accessibility within 2.0. There's the AAA and AAA standard. DOJ has sort of focused on the AA standard. I'm not going to get into the technical requirements of that standard now. Again, Mark is going to touch upon that a little bit later, but it's important just to understand at the federal level that, again, the lack of technical requirements has created this gray area, and the Department of Justice and private litigants have tried to fill that with uh, an industry standard that I think, frankly, all of us um, ought to be aiming towards substantial compliance, if at least not full compliance, because that seems to be where um, we're headed in terms of what's acceptable as equal access and equal opportunity uh, for websites. So in 
transitioning from federal law, I always tell my clients it's important to understand state law as well. State law at times provides greater protections for individuals than federal law. And this is one such instance. And I'll give you an example of state law in this space. So in October of 2017, California's governor signed into law uh, a bill that beginning in July of 2019, state agencies and entities are required to post on their website homepage as a certification that the website complies with WCAG 2.0 level AA um, or a subsequent version. And that's interesting because we don't have anything quite similar to that under federal law. So, you know, obviously if you're in California and you have a presence, you're operating and doing business there, you need to be familiar with that law. And the same goes for any jurisdiction that you're in and operating. You need to be familiar with those laws as well, because they are requiring now that you um, meet a certain level of compliance in your web presence. And in addition to federal and state laws, we of course have industry specific laws. And I'll give you an example of those in telecom. So if your organization does work in telecommunications, you need to be aware of your legal obligations there. There's something known as the Telecommunications Act, which became law in 1996. And it provides that telecom products and services need to be accessible to people with disabilities if doing so is readily achievable. So, of course, if full accessibility is not possible, then products and services must be compatible with what's known as assistive technology. An example of that would be ensuring that an image, for you know, example, can be interpreted by a screen reader. Um, the Section 255, which is a provision of that law, underwent a refresh, which was released last January, and that refresh specifically requires compliance with WCAG 2.0. So all in all, you can see that there's this patchwork of evolving law, whether it's um, federal, as we await um, technical standards to be promulgated. Um, there's the state level um, compliance issues, and then of course there's industry specific compliance issues. And really, Working with counsel um, and, and experts to understand obligations in each of those arenas is really critical um, to preventing your company from facing potential liability on a go-forward basis. So when I finish the conversation with clients about what's required under federal, state, and industry-specific laws, I typically get two big questions from them. The one which almost always comes from businesses who operate an e-commerce only presence, they don't have brick and mortar, is, well, you know, I don't have these physical requirements under traditional ADA analysis. Um, I run an e-commerce business. Uh, is my website a place of public accommodation? That's a pretty common question we get. Um, the other one has to do with third party applications. And so we're going to get to that in a minute. I want to try to tackle the e-commerce question first, because I know a lot of you out there might be um, contemplating whether or not that's a problem for you. For the most part, courts are split on whether a commercial website qualifies as a place of public accommodation uh, under the ADA. More specifically, that split centers on whether commercial websites are places of public accommodation or whether they need to be joined to a brick and mortar business. Um, Throughout the country, courts generally take one of three positions, and I'll tell you where I think the trend's going in a minute. The first position is places of public accommodation need not be physical structures. Um, the second, places of public accommodation can only be physical structures. I think that middle one is sort of the minority view. And three, for a non-physical place to be a place of public accommodation, it must have a sufficient nexus to a physical structure that constitutes a public accommodation. I think the last of those, the third one, the one that I just mentioned, is really where the majority of courts are now, but I think that there's a trend moving in favor of the first, which is, again, places of public accommodation need not be physical structures. I think that's especially true of websites, e-commerce um, that's transactional in nature. Um, because, again, the question is one of equal access and equal opportunity. Um, it's important as a company to understand if you've received a demand letter or threatened litigation or maybe you've even received a complaint, you know, which of those three areas you're in. 
what what does your local court system have to say? What kind of body of case law have they built around those three issues? It can be critical in understanding what your potential um, defenses are. Ultimately, you know, the cases demonstrate that this legal landscape is pretty murky, um, which leaves companies in a difficult position to decide whether their websites need to be ADA compliant. You know, from my perspective, companies should focus their attention on compliance, frankly, rather than the technical defense, because you're only one case away from a court either changing the law or um, evolving in such a way that six, 12, 18 months ago, um, if you're in a jurisdiction that said um, places of public accommodation can only be physical structures, courts may evolve and sort of take the middle ground where there's a nexus to the physical structure. And all of a sudden you'll be facing a defense um, that you didn't realize you would ultimately have to make. So obviously the cost of litigation go into the calculus, the public perception of being a business that's not accommodative to persons with disabilities. Um, and ultimately, you know, you make more money if you're able to serve uh, more individuals. So regardless of those buckets, if you're in e-commerce alone, I think it's in your best interest to take a hard look at making sure your website's accessible. So moving on to third party applications, this is the other question we get a lot. And that is, you know, I operate a website and um, my website is tied into third party payment solutions or third party advertisements. It's extremely common for websites to use things like third party widgets, plugins. Um, all of these systems have the potential to create ADA problems. I'll give you in sort of shorthand what I tell my clients all the time, which is the general rule of thumb. If you're looking at the page with the item in question and the URL includes your domain, then it's part of your website and therefore it's probably your issue to deal with. Uh, you can't offload liabilities to vendors or third parties really if it lives within your domain. Now, there are certain things you can do in your statements of work or master service agreements to offload some of that liability from a contractual standpoint. But from the perspective of the person using your website, again, if it lives within your domain, it's going to be your issue to deal with. I'll give you an example. So some of you familiar with this area of law might be familiar with the Winn-Dixie case. In June of 2017, a federal judge in Florida had ruled that Winn-Dixie's website violated an individual's rights under the ADA. This person was unable to use a screen reader software to use coupons and order prescriptions and find store locations um, on Winn-Dixie's website. And the allegation was that it deprived him of access to the store's cited customers and what they can do uh, online. The decision was significant for a number of reasons, but, um, I find most interesting what the court had to say about third-party applications and vendors. So according to the court, Winn-Dixie had to provide accessibility training to its employees. Um, it had to make its website two, WCAG 2.0 compliant, but then the court went on to say it has to ensure that linked third-party vendors also offer accessibility. And additionally, the court ruled that Winn-Dixie is even responsible for the parts of its website operated by third-party vendors, which at some level um, belies that general rule of thumb that I articulated earlier on this slide. And it says to me, as I counsel clients, really the takeaway is you have to ensure that your user experience on your website is a good one and that the functionality of the website is really accessible to persons with disabilities. You can't step back and say, well, I offered this website and access to my goods and services, but I facilitated that by including inaccessible um, website and website content provided by a third party. And so I think it's important that if you have those aspects of your website, you really need to do what you can now to remediate them in order to prevent future liability. Christian brought up the technical guidelines. The guidelines that he's referring to are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which were adopted about 10 years ago. Testing for digital compliance requires hundreds of specific tests to be conducted on your website. 
WCAG has divided these under four unique testing principles. The first principle, perceivable, is about making someone aware through their different senses, sight, sound, touching. Testing under this requirement include testing visual elements for alternative content, checking the contrast of text over colored backgrounds, and the readability of your content. The second principle is operable. How compatible is your site if a visitor is using a different input method, such as a screen reader, or if they can't use a keyboard, or maybe they need some extra time filling in forms? The third principle is about your site being able to be understood. Intuitively, when you walk into a room, you know where a light switch should be. Your website should be just as intuitive with consistent navigation, elements being labeled correctly, and error messages making sense. The fourth principle is about making your site modern enough where it's compatible with current technology. People who are creating tools and products for assistive technology rely on your website to use the most modern standards. Thanks, Mark. You raised some really good points there. I think it's helpful for people to understand um, the level 2.0 compliance, especially as it relates to that backdrop I gave earlier on um, the federal, state, and uh, industry-specific laws. What uh, folks on the web now see in front of them is an example of a demand letter. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, sort of what this is and what I have seen some plaintiff's law firms um, sending out and articulating their demands um, to companies who haven't taken the time, frankly, to work on a remediation plan and bring their websites up to 2.0 compliance. So what you see here is an example of demand letter that we pulled um, from online. And um, these demand letters typically precede litigation. Most of my clients will receive this type of letter before um, a lawsuit is filed. And if you were to go through the full typical demand letter, I think uh, most companies would be really alarmed. They tend to be ominous. They include oftentimes a, a very large automated scan report, uh, examples of other cases and the types of payouts that companies have had to make for failing to be compliant, um, and a lot of horror stories. And they're really intended to scare people um, into um, making a payment to plaintiff's counsel to try to reach some kind of resolution in a case before it goes to litigation. So what should you do when you get a demand letter? I think the first thing that you need to do is call somebody who's experienced uh, in these types of cases. And, you know, it's important to understand there's no individual damages under the ADA. There's something called injunctive relief, which allows a court to issue an order that prevents you from sort of continuing in your practice and there's the potential for attorney's fees, but there aren't individual damages such as compensatory or punitives. And so um, while these are very, very important issues, very serious issues that you need to pay attention to, and they could ultimately be expensive, and we'll talk about those in a, um, the expense in a few minutes, um, there's no need to panic, right? What you need to do is talk to somebody who's experienced that can help navigate you out of these issues um, you also need to start thinking about your remediation efforts. And in order to do that, I think you ought to engage a website accessibility expert. You need somebody who can evaluate the technical aspects of your website, find out where there's sort of low-hanging fruit, things that you can fix quickly, um, things that are going to take more time. And armed with that type of information, you may be able to work with uh, the plaintiff's firm in order to resolve um, the allegations before there's litigation and hopefully never have to get into litigation over something like this. Um, so those are sort of the, the first criti critical steps that I think you would need to do in order to better position yourself, um, not only to fix the problems, but also keep your costs down in attempting to do so. So in terms of cost, we get the question all the time, how expensive is this sort of thing? Um, as I mentioned before, I think early resolution is critical, uh, unless, of course, you've already started down the path of remediation. If you've already started down the path of remediation, my hope would be that your litigation costs um, could be small, in particular because there's been some good case law recently um, where lawyers on the defense side have been able to 
say to plaintiff's counsel, look, you know, we've already started down the path of remediation. Um, there's no extra relief you can get here from the court. And so your case is moot. You have no remedy. Um, oftentimes that can be a very successful defense strategy. And as a result, your litigation costs are low. If you've only thought about remediation for the first time after you receive the demand letter or complaints filed, chances are your litigation costs are gonna be even higher. An early resolution to the case, you might be just on attorney's fees anywhere from four or 5,000 up to 25 or 30,000. If you were to litigate a case through trial, you could certainly be well in excess of $100,000. And of course, there's plaintiff's counsel fees. You know, they often seek anywhere 20, 30, $40,000 per website in part because it's not only the cost of them bringing the litigation, but in terms of settlement, they oftentimes ask for ongoing fees to support their monitoring efforts. And, uh, you know, the longer that you litigate a case, the more effort and time they put into it, the more expense they have, you're going to settle it. They're going to ask for more money. And if the case goes to verdict, and there's a judgment, they can submit a fee petition. And they're entitled to attorney's fees under the ADA. If you've litigated a case for two years, you can imagine how expensive that is. It could be, again, into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, all of this is separate and apart, of course, from the type of expert fees you may have to incur, not only to assess your website, um, but if you go into litigation to battle the plaintiff's expert and what they claim are uh, barriers to access. So all in all, litigation costs can be quite significant, which again, I think points to the tremendous value of taking these issues seriously. And before you get a demand letter or a complaint, working with lawyers, working with website accessibility experts to really develop a, a robust um, and comprehensive website accessibility plan to get your own shop in order. mentioned a few times throughout the presentation sort of the drive to settlement and i think that tends to be the majority of cases <clears throat> with companies who have these issues in particular because if you haven't been paying attention to website accessibility and you were to run even a an, a, an automated scan certainly if you had some manual testers doing scans of your website you'll find that there are um, many issues that prevent uh, access to the types of good services and content that you're offering. And so companies who haven't been paying attention and get that letter realize for the first time that they're pretty much dead in the water and settlements, their only realistic option. So one of the first questions you ask yourself in terms of settlement is, well, are we going to settle with the individual who brought this case or are we going to try to settle this on a class-wide basis? And a class-wide basis can be good because it limits your potential exposure on a go forward basis. Um, but oftentimes companies don't want that. It can be a very public process. There are formal hearings that require approval of things like class notice. Notices go out to the relevant community of persons with disability <clears throat> to apprise them of their rights. So oftentimes companies look to potentially settle with only the person who brought the lawsuit. And if you do that, of course, it can be private, but there's no guarantee that on a go forward basis, you might not get um, piggyback lawsuits. And so it's important, I think, to work with counsel to really understand the pros and cons of each approach and decide what's best for my company, what's my risk tolerance, what do we want to do? <clears throat> the second question that we often get, you know, um, if it's one person that you're going to settle with, well, what about cooperation clauses with opposing counsel um, to assist you in the event that there are follow-up lawsuits? You know, some examples um, of that uh, and key, other key terms that go into these settlement agreements, um, you may be required to retain an accessibility expert to evaluate access barriers. You might have to commit to a remediation date with substantial compliance. You know, you ask yourself, what's the standard that you need to commit to as part of the settlement agreement? Mark talked earlier about 2.0 AA, but as I mentioned as well, there's other, there's A and, and AAA, and now there's 
um, WCAG 2.1. <clears throat> and so you have to fill in the appropriate um, standard. And, and of course, that has its own implications for the amount of time and resources you're going to need to devote to bringing the website into compliance. And of course, one of the other key settlement terms is ongoing monitoring and reporting and how often you're going to have to make reports, for example, to a plaintiff's lawyer about your efforts to remediate um, website issues. One of the other issues with settlement, of course, is what happens um, when settlement's completed. In other words, you reach an agreement, part of the runoff period for you to fix the website might be 12 months or maybe it's eight months or 16 months. <clears throat> During that interim time, are you insulated from other losses? What we're beginning to see on the defense side is that um, there are many piggyback losses in cases where companies may have settled with the name plaintiff only, um, but yet there's another plaintiff or another firm that comes along in the interim runoff period and they try to bring another demand letter, another lawsuit. And so the question is, you know, what can you do? Well, the name of the game here is mootness. And I mentioned this before in one of the previous slides. If you can demonstrate that there isn't any additional relief that a court can provide, you may have the opportunity to successfully argue that um, the plaintiff is not entitled to relief and that the lawsuit should be dismissed. That sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't. Again, much like everything in the law, it depends on what jurisdiction you're in, what the contours of your settlement agreement were, how robust it was, and of course, how far along are you in remediating the website accessibility issues. <clears throat> to me, the message is clear. Regardless of what jurisdiction is, you have to have a plan to tackle the low-hanging fruit and a policy to identify and correct barriers to access. Um, you need a policy for continuing to review the accessibility and really a response plan in place for that subsequent demand letter um, and proactive efforts to find a quick and inexpensive resolution if you get one. You can't sit on accessibility. You really need, you know, for example, if your IT department isn't familiar with these issues, you need to go out and hire that website accessibility expert <clears throat> to train you and your group as quickly as you can and to get in and start making the changes as fast as you can. The longer you wait, I think the more perilous of a situation you get into because there's going to be other persons with disabilities along the way that are using your website and running into the same types of challenges. So I think it's only a matter of time before they turn around um, and bring their own claims. So obviously these steps won't guarantee you um, that you won't get any follow-up lawsuits, but certainly they seem to, to mitigate that type of risk. So best practices from my perspective, obviously consult with counsel. Um, counsel can sort of give you the lay of the land in terms of what jurisdiction you're in and what limits you might have with respect to uh, the types of defenses that you can muster. Um, they'll also be able to um, introduce you to folks um, who can help you from a technical perspective. And along these lines, I think it's critical that you work with uh, a website accessibility expert hand in hand <clears throat> with counsel to try to make sure that from a technical perspective, you're meeting at a minimum, the substantial compliance with whatever industry norm is at the time in the absence of there being actual technical requirements promulgated under applicable law. The other best practice, of course, and this is a very easy one to do, and that's add an accessibility statement uh, to your website. That's critical. You ought to have a statement on there, and you ought to have a way for folks uh, in order to contact you in the event that they're unable to navigate areas of your website, especially if your website is transactional. If you give them another avenue, another opportunity to access goods and services, I think that can be a critical defense <clears throat> in order to mitigate your potential liability. To that end, provide a dedicated line and resources for accessibility issues. Along the way, you need to be auditing your website with human and automated tools. You know, from my experience, the automated tools are great, but they're never a substitute for what it's like to have somebody with a disability actually using your website and giving you feedback on um, the functionality of the website, 
what the limitations are, what types of issues they run into. I think that's absolutely critical if you want to do a comprehensive review of the website and make a, a, a comprehensive commitment to remediation. You have to do it on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, websites change, standards change, technology changes. Uh, auditing your website using a human tester might not be feasible uh, on a very regular basis, but you could certainly use accessibility testing tools to do it on a more frequent and I would recommend quarterly basis. Your IT staff, people designing the website, people interfacing with the folks who do it if you have a third party vendor, all of them should be trained on accessibility issues, understanding not just the ADA from a high level, but the industry standards in terms of whether it's 2.0 or what we may eventually see is 2.1 compliance. You need to develop a web and mobile app accessibility plan. Just like you do pl business plans for other areas and compliance, you need to have one so that there's an ongoing commitment, there's ownership, there's stakeholders um, who are responsible for ensuring that these issues are addressed. To that end, assign a website accessibility coordinator. It might be somebody in operations, it might be somebody in HR. They're already taking over uh, functions related to the ADA from an employee standpoint. They should be familiar with the ADA as it relates to issues of public accommodation and website accessibility. And of course, add supplementing provisions to your vendor contracts. I mentioned that earlier. You know, you can't shift liability from the perspective of the person necessarily using your website, but on a contractual basis, you may want to um, include indemnity provisions, reps and warranties, things of that nature in your master service agreements and statement of work. All of those things together are really best practices um, that you should implement in order to not only become a better business in terms of one that's accessible to your clients, but also one that uh, minimizes risk as we go forward and uh, minimizes the opportunity for litigation. We've received uh, quite a few questions. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, one of the first ones that we received is a WCAG 2.1 just came out. When do you expect that to be the legal standard? So that's a great question. Um, 2.1 from my perspective adds just a handful of additional requirements to 2.0. And given the fact that I've seen a lot of plaintiff's firms uh, very opportunistically seize on 2.0 um, and work their way through a number of industries, I think it's only a short matter of time before they take 2.1 and go back to the well, so to speak, um, and look to companies and say, look, um, what we did before was great, that was a snapshot in time, but now that 2.1 is out, you need to be compliant with a higher standard, and I see that you're not doing that. And because the government has not promulgated technical requirements, again, we have a gray area, and we have a gray area within which companies fearful of litigation and perhaps <clears throat> bad publicity and bad press are going to be concerned with not being 2.1 compliant and may settle cases for the same reason they settled 2.0 level cases. And so um, it, it may not necessarily be a question about when that's the new law or the new standard, but when will counsel start pressing that in terms of their demand letters? And when will companies come around to acknowledging that that's sort of the state of technology today and what they need to be compliant with? So now that 2.1 is, has come out and we see what it is. And again, frankly, from my perspective, it's not that much more burdensome to comply with than 2.0. Um, the advice that I'm going to certainly give to my clients is that they start focusing on that as part of their remediation efforts. Another good question that we have is, if we pass an automated scan, are we considered accessible? And the fact of the matter is, automated testing tools are a great way to start, but they only have the ability to test a maximum of 25% of the checkpoints within WCAG. 
It's a computer. It can only go so far. It cannot test any human interaction, such as filling out a form, making a purchase, requesting information, using a calculator. It cannot test any of that. That's why it's very important when you're considering doing an audit, that it is a complete audit, which includes both automated and human testing. And human testing has to be done by individuals with disabilities. The next question we have, can we use a text-only website to accommodate people who have issues with our website? The answer to that is no. Um, the, you, the concept of separate but equal uh, is not allowed in the industry. Whatever your website is for a sighted person or a person without disabilities, it needs to offer the disabled individual the same experience and user flow. So that concept of a text-only website does not work in this industry and is not allowed. The next question, if my mobile application is just information and has no e-commerce functionality, is it required to be accessible? The answer to that question is yes, it does need to be accessible so that whomever is coming to your site, whether it's informational to make a purchase or to fill out a form, whatever you're offering to the public has to be accessible. Uh, it doesn't ma matter if it is not an e-commerce functionality or if you're not offering that, it still needs to be accessible. The next question, we're a motorcycle parts company and blind people don't use or buy our products. Do we still need to make our website accessible? Christian, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, the issue is not from the perspective of the individual using the product. The question is, do they have equal access, equal opportunity, just as anybody else without a disability to um, enjoy your product offering experience, your goods and services. So an individual, in the example that you gave with respect to the motorcycle, of course, they're not necessarily driving the motorcycle, but they might be a passenger on the motorcycle. Of course, they might also be buying the motorcycle as a gift for somebody else. And so the notion that just because they're not capable of using the product doesn't mean they shouldn't have the equal access, equal opportunity to the experience of the sale and the gathering of information. Again, the examples I gave, they could still be a customer of the product. It could be for somebody else, or they could be a passenger of the product in this instance. So I think, you know, when I counsel companies who ask those types of questions, worry less about the person and about their disability. We're mo worry more about the functionality of the website, the quality of the experience, and their ability to use and enjoy the website just as a person would without a disability. It looks like we are out of time for our webinar. I'd like to thank everybody for participating. I hope you found this very informative. If you do have any additional questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. You can email us your questions at contact at voia.org. Once again, thank you and have a wonderful day.